So, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to today's webinar. And uh, today I have the, the, the pleasure to, do, to welcome two specialists from the OCD, John, senior economist, and Hyun Jong, an economist there in Paris. And we have met both of them the last time in May when they were on a fact-finding mission here in Korea uh, for the country port Korea. And uh, it was really interesting uh, to go through those questions uh, and uh, etc. Um, and today I'm very happy that they will actually share with us the outcome of or the, the key outcome of the, of the country port because it's very fresh. Uh, it was just released this Monday here in Sejong. Um, John and I, we were bumping in very briefly for about 10 seconds below Seoul Station because he was in the rush. So I had no time at all to, to question him, to get some pre-information. But today I'm as interested as you all are to learn more about the country port career. Um, just one very brief remark about questions. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure that there will be many questions. Um, we have in the past always used the chat box to raise questions. So if you have questions, please use the chat box in the Zoom function below the screen. And then John and Hyunjong will answer. I will be off as from now because I will provide the stage to John and Hyunjong and will only be taking over my speaking role either for the closing remarks or let's say when there are no questions in between. So, without further ado, John Hyunjung, please take it over. Thank you, uh, Christoph. I will just share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah, very good. So, uh, so thanks a lot to the ECCK and to Christoph for hosting us today and also for your um, uh, discussions and advice that we, we had on our previous encounters when we were preparing this report. So uh, uh, Hin Jong and I, we are part of the OSD Korea desk, uh, monitoring the Korean economy um, and uh, our most important work is the or the highlight of our work is really the um, the economic survey a um, fairly extensive report where we take the temperature of, of the economy of our member countries every every two years so uh, this year's korea survey was written by Hyunjung wang and me both here present and randall jones the living legend who used to have my position until he retired a few years ago he, he wrote a chapter about youth employment and we also had substantial contributions from vincent Cohn, yun yong yang and axel pervin and uh, since we want you all to be able to read the full report we have asked the ECCK to distribute uh, complementary login details to OSD's li iLibrary, where you find uh, the full report. So it doesn't, this does not only give you access to the report, it will also give you access to pretty much all OECD publications and most of our data. So for those of you interested in OECD work, it should be a gold mine. So, uh, but we would ask you as a gentleman, gentleman's or gentlewoman's agreement not to share these, but if you know someone who would also want access, you can just uh, put them in contact with us and, and we will take care of that. So with this introduction, I leave the floor to my colleague, uh, Hyun Jong. Okay, so um, before starting my presentation, I'd like to give a brief overview of the presentation. First of all, we will cover um, Korea's macroeconomic situation, and then we'll move on to structural issues such as green growth, productivity gaps, youth employment, and social safety nets. So let me start with the presentation on Korea's macroeconomic issues. So Korea has experienced very um, rapid economic development over the past decades. And in 2022, GDP per capita surpassed the OECD average for the first time. And next slide, please. So in 2020, Korea experienced only a shallow recession, mainly thanks to its very 
capable management of the COVID. So Korea was able to contain the pandemic without a national lockdown, unlike most other OECD countries, which led to relatively um, limited disruptions to the economy. And then the economy rebounded strongly in 2021, and partly driven by strong external demand on Korea's key export items like semiconductors. The recovery continued into 2022. The labor market has recovered and un unemployment has already normalized and total employment also surpassed pre-pandemic level. So labor market is, uh, is tightening now. Um, at the same time, inflation has risen fast in 2022. And despite a slight decrease in August, headline consumer price inflation remained almost triple the 2% inflation target. And so it hovers around 6% now. Uh, it reflects persistent underlying pressures, including from the supply bottlenecks and recovering consumption. And core inflation, which excludes food and energy, um, which is uh, volatile, um, continues to increase, reaching around 4%, reflecting a broadening inflation pressures to various categories of goods and services like uh, restaurants and furnishings. So now the recovery is slowing. After a strong rebound by around 4% last year, real GDP is projected to grow less than 3% this year and slightly above 2% next year. And inflation is set to remain elevated based on the assumption that um, global oil prices uh, will, will, will remain around current levels throughout 2023. And such high inflation will weigh on households' rate income and dragging the recovery of private consumption. Next slide, please. So how can macroeconomic uh, policies like fiscal and monetary policy support a resilient recovery? This is a question. Um, well, Bank of Korea started to increase key policy rates already in August last year raising it in seven steps from 0.5% to 2.5%. And we share the view of the Bank of Korea that this was timely and appropriate. But recently, inflation expectations have increased sharply and labor market is tightening, as I mentioned before. And all this, this uh, factors put upward pressures on nominal wages. And also the Korean won has been weakening, uh, which will compound inflationary pressures. So now Bank of Korea faces heightened challenges in credibility, bringing inflation to target while affording economic recovery. Um, and it would be still very important to continue to move towards a less accommodative, accommodative monetary policy. So it should keep increasing inflation rates. Um, with the with the view to keep inflation expectations in check to prevent uh, the so-called price wage spiral. Um, next slide, please. And about the fiscal policy. So fiscal response during the pandemic was very swift and appropriate, which could support household income during the pandemic. And according to Statistics Korea, household disposable income increased quite significantly for all income groups in 2022, in 2020. But now fiscal support should be scaled back as planned by the government and should be deployed in ways that do not exacerbate inflationary pressures and to help the central bank contain inflation. So this requires delivering maximum relief to those vulnerable, especially to rising living costs. And more detailed um, uh, policy measures that we recommend is, uh, is, um, can be found in this survey, in the, in the, in the, um, the economic survey and published this, this Monday. Next slide, please. So going forward, Reforms are needed to ensure long-term fiscal sustainability. And government debt remains relatively low in international comparison, but population aging is relatively rapid in Korea, which is expected to put high spending pressures in the long term, especially through 
higher demand on healthcare and pensions. So um, some reforms are needed to stabilize public debt in the longer term, especially increasing closing employment gaps of women and youth and increasing pensionable age. And our long-term model suggests that this will significantly reduce the, the long-term the, the debt in the longer term. Um, and we'll discuss in more detail uh, about these reforms uh, later. So um, yeah, this, these are the summary of recommendations to, to support a resilient recovery that I already mentioned. And from now on, Yon will cover some structural issues. Yeah. Yes, I was on mute. Thanks. Um, we cover different structural issues in the survey. We we have two special chapters, which we will get back to. But also in uh, in the first chapter, we we go a bit sort of uh, we have sort of a little quicker run through of some uh, some structural issues as well. And one issue which is uh, can be quite challenging to to discuss because there are many tough political choices to make going forward is is about climate policies um, so this is actually an area where we where we can have some tough discussions with government and we we did expect this also this year with with the korean government but uh, surprisingly they uh, they were quite welcoming to to the uh, findings that we will now now discuss with you. So um, if I would add a subtitle to this section's heading, it would be that Korea's emissions trading scheme should be Korea's best friend to reach climate pledges, but it's not yet. Korea has committed to reducing emissions by 40% from the 2018 level by 2030 and to net zero by 2050 and this will obviously necessitate some bold policy actions going forward as this graph shows and this will have a considerable cost which should be minimized to to sort of avoid well the cost in both in political terms and in uh, and in financial terms so um so therefore, efficient policies are needed. Korea's uh, manufacturing and exporting sector and electricity production are emission intensive. And this points to a pretty challenging transition when you have concentrated emissions in, in certain sectors like this. But the fact that uh, emission intensity is high also leaves room for relatively low cost emission reductions with considerable co-benefits from cleaner air as illustrated by this this photo here um the, the so-called low low hanging fruits that may have been picked already in in some other countries korea's emission trading scheme was the first in East Asia, and it should be recognized by policymakers as the best tool to reduce emissions as much as possible at lowest possible cost. And this, the KETS puts a price on carbon from a large share of emissions, as you see uh, reflected in this figure. But too many allowances are handed out for free, and its overall emissions limit is not yet aligned with the actual overall emission reduction targets, which they should be. Um, but I mean, this may be uh, that this may 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 yet happen. But uh, but the 2030 is not so far away, so it should happen soon, sooner rather than later. And one very important thing, and also one 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 um, recommendation where we did expect some uh, some pushback from the government, which we actually did not get in the end is that um, the electricity sector regulations prevent the carbon price in the emissions trading scheme from actually affecting uh, electricity production because uh, because there's not it's not really a market determining uh, which which uh, uh, which uh, facility produces the electricity at, at any given point in time it's it's a uh, 
it's kind of a formula and, and sort of ex expert expert committee deciding. And, uh, and in this formula, the, the carbon price is not correctly taken in, into account. So uh, this, this would be solved if you, if you deregulated the electricity market so that the actual marginal cost of procuring emission, emission permits in the ETS would decide who actually produce electricity at any given point of time. Finally, um, on a positive note, the political economy of climate policies is difficult and politicians have found it very difficult to do anything seen as raising energy costs to ordinary people as you also witnessed in Korea when you had lorry drivers protesting in the, in the streets uh, back in May. But the uh, new OECD research shows that there is a silver lining if these revenues are linked to support for low carbon technologies and infrastructure. So these are our recommendations. It's uh, about aligning the emissions trading scheme with the actual emission targets. And it's about uh, uh, making sure that, I mean, uh, best, the best would be to deregulate um, uh, the electricity sector, but uh, at least making sure that whatever framework is there uh, make, can make the carbon price feed through and incentivize emission reductions in the electricity sector. Ele I'm talking primarily about electricity generation, not use here, even though on the use side, there are also things to be done, but we didn't go so, so far into this. And, uh, and to make this all work better, uh, a larger share of allowances uh, in the KETS should be sold, auctioned to entities not given out for free. And these revenues that you collect could be used to subsidize green technologies and infrastructure, and this would make it more palatable to, to people that you actually impose this kind of tax. So um, as kind of a background to, to the rest of the structural analysis we will uh, present to you now, um, I want to say something about productivity gaps and labor market dualism. Because Korea structural challenges can only be properly understood in the context of productivity gaps and, and these labor market dualisms. Export-led growth and the nurturing of large exporting companies was an important part of Korea's growth strategy. Um, but, and, and it was quite successful, I must say. I mean, you can just look at numbers as, as, as per the graph Hin Jong showed that in the beginning. But the, it led the ground for considerable and persistent productivity gaps to smaller companies. So, so this, uh, this figure basically shows that, the, that productivity gaps and, uh, and, uh, and gaps in, uh, in wages uh, are two, two sides of the same coin. So large firms typically offer highly educated workers well-paid jobs, good working conditions, regular employment, and social insurance coverage. But their share of employment has fallen over time as production has been automated and uh, also moved offshore as the conglomerates have become more and more international. Low productivity, uh, small and medium sized enterprises hire a large share of non-regular workers who not only earn less, but are also less protected as you see in this figure. They have uh, they are less likely to be have employment insurance, national health insurance, national pension system uh, membership, the right to bonus payments, company pensions, and not least union membership, which is pretty much non-existent. So, so these SMEs, they, as a consequence, they find it hard to attract the skilled workers needed to boost productivity, for example, by adopting digital technologies, because they are simply not attractive to young people who, who want a job, as we will get back to. Um, number, I mean, and, and the 
politicians they recognize this uh, this discrepancy between large and small companies and uh, many policies have therefore been put in place to support these SMEs including subsidies favorable access to public procurement regulations differentiated by company size and even whole market segments which are off limit for for the larger companies and i think each of these policies probably has some justification if seen in isolation uh, but uh, they sum up to a system that supports the survival of um, low productivity firms against a backdrop of regulatory complexity which is obviously not uh, not good so i'll jump a bit to a uh, seemingly unrelated topic but it's actually quite related um, I'll get back to why. Because over the past few decades, education and access to jobs have become increasingly equal between genders. The large scale rollout of publicly funded daycare and kindergartens has raised employment rates to the level of Nordic countries. But the working life and social norms have not kept pace. So combining career and having children is not, often not an option when you face norms and expectations based on uh, traditional gender roles and long working hours and limited flexibility in the workplace. So mothers returning to working life, and, and here's the connection with the productivity thing. Mothers returning to working life tends to find that only those low paid non-regular jobs in low productivity SMEs are available. So, so these productiv productivity gaps also become a um, disincentive to, to actually have children or it sort of increases or compounds these disincentives that are there. And the young women therefore postpone, postpone family formation, family formation, and they have fewer children over the lifetime as you see in this figure of the total fertility rate. And this has put Korea on the path to rapid aging, which will lead to fiscal and labor market pressures going forward. So I think um, I will not go through all these recommendations, but I will just stress the first one, that increasing competition by reducing regulations is very important because these dualities, um, I think it's less about, um, it's less about sort of unfair competition by the big companies, even though, of course, this is important. I, there should be fairness, there should be fair competition at this level, but it's also about ensuring that there is competition at, that the SMEs actually face competition, that they cannot find this kind of niche where they have a sort of soft cushion provided by, um, by regulations or supports or, or, or whatever, where they can continue operating and making money even if they are not productive. So competition is the, is the key here. On that note, I switch to our chapter about youth employment. This was the chapter was uh, authored by uh, Randall Jones, uh, the living, living legend who used to occupy my, um, my spot at the OECD, but who's, he's no, now retired. So, um, we, we, uh, we, we named this, this new term, the golden ticket syndrome. Um, and I'll try to explain why. Um, I guess many of you have seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or, or, or read the book. So in this book or movie, if you open a chocolate with a golden ticket inside the wrapping, you, can, um, you basically won a ticket to a good life. And uh, of course, the more chocolates you buy, the, the bigger the chance you have to to, to get this golden ticket. And, and I mean, either you, you can work hard, you, you're, you're poor, you can work hard to make money to buy this chocolates, or you have rich parents, you can sort of buy it for you. So, but the, the struggle to get this golden ticket, that's the, that's the point. So when, when youth face these gaps in income and social protection, they, they want to win this golden, golden ticket it is to get one of these good jobs in um, in the um, in the big companies who who pay well with they have a uh, good protection and um, job protection and social insurance and and so on because this is a ticket to a good a good life and uh, the ticket to support a family 
And uh, this ticket is won by um, especially, you know, especially one point in, in life, which is the, uh, the university entrance exam. But of course, also the next step, which is to, to, to um, when, when you're done, well, when you have graduated from university to, to actually get into one of these um, larger companies or the, or the public sector, of course. So uh, this race has some negative effects and we dedicate uh, this whole chapter of the surveys to analyze um, the, the problem of low youth employment as you see here in this figure. And much of the problem is this race for credentials where you can reset the entrance exam and there are also examinations from employers. Um, uh, and, and it's a very heavy emphasis in Korea on formal qualifications. Unlike in many other countries, if you do some low quality work early in your career, it's seen as a valuable experience in, uh, in most countries. While in Korea, it may be seen as a, a liability. It may sort of scar you uh, for, uh, for your next job instead of being a springboard. So while small and medium-sized enterprises are screaming for workers, many young simply do not want to even apply there. But uh, there are some clear gender differences in, um, in youth employment. Young men, they have seen declining employment rates and an increasing share of them are not in employment education or training, the so-called needs. And this is probably much a consequence of the reduced number of manufacturing jobs due to automation and outsourcing, which we show here in, in this figure. And if you look at the, at, at the picture for, for young women, um, you, you see the opposite development. The, their employment rates have increased to the level of young men and the need rates have been falling to the level of young men. So you have had sort of equalization between genders in these um, in 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 the youngest age groups, but uh, unfortunately, it's um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's not um, it's it's not going the right way for everyone. I mean, it, it's uh, it's going the right way for for women, but but uh, but young men they have had um, they have fallen behind. So. Uh, so this is um, this is basically what drives uh, this sort of golden ticket syndrome. Young people want to work in a large company or the public sector, as you see here in in the in the left hand side. And the way to achieve this is through higher education, as you see in the right hand side graph. That if you have higher education, university, masters, or higher, you maximize your chances of actually getting one of these. Uh, good jobs. Therefore, young Koreans are the most highly educated in the OECD with approximately 70% having a university degree. A high level of skills is a good thing, but there is a concern of inflation that you need a university degree to do pretty much any job. And the name of your university becomes an important sorting mechanism since everyone already has, has this high education. But this is not necessarily an efficient system. There are mismatches to the skills demanded by employers and many study things that they are not interested in or talented in just because the name of the university is more important than what you actually learn there. And of course, the name of the university, when it's so important, competition to get into one of the top universities starts already from a very young age and with a lot of pressure being put on children and youth, which does not make them happy. It actually makes them, them unhappy as, uh, as comparative studies between countries show that their life satisfaction is, is, is quite low in Korea compared to other countries. So um, to uh, recommendations to promote youth employment, I think, again, you know, doing something about the productivity gaps is very important here. But also I think 
finding ways and this is a bit tough because because in a way this um this uh, university entrance exam is untouchable it's a sort of um, holy grail in the in the korean system you know parents they if you take this away you know parents say you know how, how can how can you sort of objectively measure my how skilled my my child is if they if if they don't have this objective way of measuring them but uh, but the fact is that that this uh, this system is uh, is not uh, it has many many downsides and it's not necessarily efficient as i showed so reducing the emphasis on the standardized university entrance exam uh, I, I think that this should be done and i think you should sort of discuss the whole the whole system of university entrance exam and, and perhaps uh, replace it by something else so even though i know politically this will probably not happen so um, yeah we also have other recommendations but you can read about them in more detail in the survey so with that i will leave it to hunjong to present uh, the last special chapter of the survey uh, which she has written thanks thank you um so yes let me um cover the, the strength uh, how to strengthen the social safety net in korea and um, next slide please um so this slide um, it's rapid economic development in uh, Korea. Uh, Korea still has relatively high poverty rates, uh, notably for the old, and gap in income and social protection between regular and non-regular workers are, are very large, as you mentioned. And this largely reflects incomplete social statement for both working age population and the older population. And the COVID pandemic has further highlighted the importance of ensuring adequate social protection. So against this background, this chapter um, explores ways to improve the social safety net for both uh, working age population and old age, old age people. And we also identify cost-effective solutions to secure long-run financial sustainability. So let me first discuss the working age social safety net. So a major weakness of the so social safety net for the working age population is its low coverage of income insurance. So around half of the entire labor force in Korea does not have access to employment insurance. So it means that they cannot get income support through unemployment benefits when they lose jobs. Broadly, there are two reasons for the low coverage. One reason is that employment insurance is not compulsory for non-salaried workers, such as self-employed. And second reason is that a sizable share of employees do not contribute despite their legal obligation to do so. And this largely reflects weak enforcement measures. For instance, in Korea, employers are rarely sanctioned for not registering their workers in the employment insurance system. Next slide, please. So a second issue is the design of an income benefit which reduce work incentives for low-income workers. Now, Korean income insurance beneficiaries returning to a minimum wage job would lose by working, according to the OECD model. And this is very unique among OECD countries and can potentially uh, trap employment insurance recipients in unemployment. So it, re it raises unemployment risk for the, for the low-income workers. This is because the unemployment benefit floor, so the minimum level of the un unemployment benefit is linked, which was linked to the minimum wage, have increased very rapidly. So now the unemployment benefit has almost, the, 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 um, the minimum level of, un of unemployment benefit have almost converged to the ceiling, the maximum uh, amount of the income benefit, which is very unique on the UC country. And then let me move on to the uh, weak social safety net of, of, um, for older age populations. So next slide, please. Uh, yes, no, this, this slide. So um, yeah, the pension system 
fails to secure adequate pension income for many seniors. Firstly, basic pension is low and it's very is um, poorly, poorly targeted. So currently the basic pension provides a 300,000 won per month, which is among the lowest in the OECD. But the basic pension is provided to nearly 70% of the elderly, which means that the basic pension in Korea spreads out resources very thinly over a large segment of the older population. And another issue is low pensions provided by the National Pension Service. So this is Kuminyangum uh, in Korean. And unlike the basic pension, which is financed by taxes, this pension is contribution-based. And according to data from National Pension Service, these pensions are mostly below the poverty line. The low pension from the National Pension Service partly reflects low replacement rates. So for instance, for a full career worker with an average wage, a net pension amount they will receive and retire is only 31% of their net pre-retirement earnings, which is 11 percentage points lower than the OECD average. But, and another issue, even worse, is the relatively short contribution period. So in 2020, the contribution period was only 11 years for new pensioners. So this is very short compared to other OECD countries. Next slide, please. And besides pensions, there is also room for improvement in health and long-term care. Korea has made rapid improvements in life expectancy and health outcomes, but Korea's healthcare system still has some weaknesses. Firstly, healthcare is unaffordable for many, despite the uh, mandatory healthcare insurance with universal coverage in Korea. And this, partly reflects that uh, many poor elderly are not eligible for healthcare benefits, mainly due to the so-called family obligation rule, uh, in Korean, which is a means test also taking into account the income of close family members. This is unique among the OEC countries and cannot be found in, uh, in other OEC countries. And second issue, Next slide, please. Uh, second issue is on over reliance on hospitals. Many recipients of long term care are unnecessarily hospitalized through hospitals. So, Korea has long term care hospitals, which is not common in the OECD countries. So, this cannot be, uh, this is very unique uh, in, in, in Korea. In principle, this long term care hospitals should deliver medical services for patients who need a longer hospital stay. But in practice, many elderly who do not need hospitalization or medical care choose to stay in hospital. So many patients who actually need medical services at the long-term care hospitals are unable to receive their this, uh, medical services because of lack of available beds. And it also contributes to the fact that most of the long-term care spending goes to hospitals, unlike in any other OECD country, leading to inefficient use of resources. This situation reflects a number of factors, one of which is using hospitals is more financially attractive for care recipients than using long-term care institutions or home care. And this is because reimbursement schemes under healthcare insurance is more advantageous than reimbursing in the long-term care insurance. So for, for patients, for um, carers they, and for care recipients, they, they they're uh, choosing the um, long-term care hospitals is more profitable than, than choosing to stay at, uh, at the social care um, institutions or, or home care. Another factor is that there is lack of accessible, affordable, and high quality long term care, uh, home care services. And uh, this reflects low financial and human resources, especially for um, home visiting um, nurses. So, um, next slide, please. So, this is summary of our recommendations to strengthen how to, to improve the situation. Um, I'll not uh, present all, but just a few. Uh, for, for instance, for the working age safety net, measures are needed to expand the coverage of insurance 
notably including the self-employed and making the, the self-employed insurance a compulsory, accompanied by more effective enforcement measures. And the government plans to expand informal insurance coverage to all working people by 2025, but this effort will be ineffective unless it is accompanied by more effective enforcement measures. Because uh, as, as I mentioned, these employers are rarely functioning for not registering their workers in the informal insurance system. And secondly, uh, we recommend to pursue a broad pension reform and an immediate priority to tackle the elderly poverty in the short term is increasing the benefit level significantly. Um, so benefit level based pensions quite significantly while reducing the coverage. So it should better target those with the highest needs. And then um, also it should be accompanied by, accompanied by um, improving the contribution-based national pension. Uh, for instance, uh, by raising the pension eligibility age and increasing risk placement rates. Um, and then uh, to improve the uh, long-term care and, uh, and, and health care, it's very important to harmonize long-term care insurance and health care insurance reimbursement schemes um, to reduce uh, the, the unnecessary um, hospitalizations. And yeah, so this is uh, um, the the uh, the summary of our recommendations. But more, but more detailed discussions can be can be found in the in the survey. So yes, this is uh, the end of our presentation. Thank you. Yes. So we are looking forward to your questions. Um, Yeah, there was this um, this this one question here. If I see this, if I read this correctly, so it's from Habib Dakil Filo. Uh, it's about fertility rate and um, that that birth rates are rapidly decreasing in South Korea. And how do you believe it will develop in the next five to ten years? Um, I guess I can try to answer that. I mean, of course, that's the million dollar question. That it's, it's sort of, it's kind of hard to see how much further it can fall. It's at uh, 0 0.81. And if it, of course it has been on in the 0 0.8-ish the, the, the last uh, three years. Um, I, I, I mean, we, we are not fertility experts, uh, but we, we are trying to look at the causes. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, to, to do something about it, uh, experience shows that you, or newer research in this field shows that those countries that, the, that manage to, to, uh, to uh, allow women to combine career and family in a good way, uh, of course, I mean, the, sort of the, the poster child children of, of these things are often the Nordics. They are often uh, shown as sort of good practice examples. And, and these, these countries can combine both high incomes and uh, high GDP growth, uh, but also high, high fertility. So, um, yeah, I think that's um, okay. Now there are some questions coming in. All right. Um, I think I'll start with one question about uh, the um, about climate targets from Andrew Millard. Uh, the uh, the Korean government has set very optimistic targets, especially when you look at uh, at the emission trends uh, the past ten to fifteen years. 
And uh, most of these emission reductions will have to be borne by private companies. And how can the Korean government effectively enforce the implementation of such policies? Um, and he points to um, to um, to Europe, where where some companies have difficulties meeting EU environmental standards and enforcing implementation. Um, yeah, I think this is a a good question, and, and it's it's a very big concern. I think uh, in in um, I think within the uh, the uh, civil service in Korea, I think yeah, I think um, it, there is a recognition that this is a very big and very challenging task, and I think also, in, of course, in the business community, uh, it's the same. And I think I think anyone and anyone trying to to pretend otherwise are, are either they don't know exactly what they're talking about, or or they are not completely honest. So um, so it is challenging. Um, which is why we um, strongly advise that uh, that uh, the government use uh, cost efficient tools uh, to uh, to uh, to um, implement these targets and uh, and the, the first line of defense should be the emissions trading scheme which uh, which is a direct way to 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 um, to put the emissions on a trajectory uh, which is consistent with with targets. So um, and and it does so in the least cost way because uh, companies uh, are uh, free to use their own propri proprietary information to reduce where where it costs the, the least for them to reduce. So so I think that's the first line of defense. But you will of course also need lots of complementary policies. You need you will need some supports. You will need some some regulations. Um, but uh, we didn't go into detail about this this time, since we think this this recommendation to use the ETS for what this was it was supposed to be used for, and also ensuring that prices flow through into the into the production uh, decisions of companies, especially in the electricity sector, that this is uh, this is a very very important sort of foundation for uh, for a uh, for climate policies in Korea. Um, uh, Hyun Jong, there is a question here about uh, severance pay should be transferred to pensions. Should this be done by companies or by government? Perhaps, perhaps you could say a bit more about this, uh, the severance payments. I think that's that's an important uh, issue. Right, right. Um, yes, this should be done. Uh, this, these are private pensions, not public pensions. So this should be uh, done by the company levels. But the government should play an important role here. So, for instance, through tax measures, um, like uh, making making the the, uh, the choosing the severance pay more attractive compared to choosing the, the lump sum payment as if uh, is, a, is an important measure. And uh, well, the government uh, also to already took some steps uh, in this direction, but more can be done. So, so it, it'd be uh, still the, the it's more attractive to, to receive uh, to choose the, the lump sum payment rather than the the, 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 um, the pension corporate pension. So the government should play a more more play more more role here, and and also. Um, uh, and also the uh, currently the severance lump sum payments option is still allowed. So what the government should do uh, is what we recommend is taxing the return allowance as, as income and then abolishing severance pay and turning into a pure pension scheme in the, in the, in the, if, um, in the in going forward. And this is our, our recommendation. I could have that. I this is sort of hugely unpopular because um, because uh, workers they they want their lump sum severance pay, and this is because they know that <clears throat> they know that they are uh, probably um, that many of them will be um, 
will be asked to leave the company when they reach a certain age. Uh, yeah, well, so around 50 perhaps. And they are still still pretty young and, um, and they have a lot of, lot of things they want to achieve in their lives. And if they get the severance pay, they can start a, um, a business, a chicken shop or, or some other business, uh, which is a way also to, to, uh, to get the retirement income. Um, so, uh, and, and from the company's point of view, the reason why they let people go at a relatively young age is partly to do with the severance pay because the severance pay is a multiple of the, uh, of the, of the wage you receive at the time of retirement. And, uh, and, when, um, and in Korea, the, uh, the, the, the wage increases very much with age. So, so it becomes very, very expensive to, uh, to fire people when they are uh, above a certain age. So, so it's better to fire them a bit before or, or I mean, not fire them, but, but ask them gently to, to, to leave the company. So, um, so it's sort of a negative feedback loop here. Um, as long as the system is the way it is, it's uh, all, all the parties involved are sort of incentivized to defend the system as it is. While uh, it's not a sort of good equilibrium if you look at it uh, in the sort of systemic, from systemic point of view. Let me see. I think perhaps um, I, yeah, there was this question about youth employment. If you see signs that first time jobs seekers preferences for big companies will change in the near future. For instance, there has been a noticeable uptick in the numbers of high paying jobs in smaller IT companies, startups and foreign companies. For these jobs, perhaps formal qualifications are less important and Gen C population also seems to exhibit reduced level of desire for table jobs. Could these shifts naturally lead to increase in SME productivity and fill the gaps at rest? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think this is a good point, not only about youth employment. I think many of the, um, I think many of those challenges we see in Korea, which are related to, to people's norms and habits, they are actually changing quite rapidly. And this is because the younger generations, they are, they are more, um, I mean, uh, when it comes to, they, they are not sort of as focused as previous generations on, um, on getting uh, table jobs. Uh, they, are, uh, they are more positive to gender equality sharing of uh, household work and so on. So, so things are changing, but I think these processes are slower than the economic drivers that reduce the table jobs, that, uh, that um, um, sort of fires this, uh, feeds this, this sort of race for qualifications. Um, so I think the sort of economy moves faster than the uh, than the norms, but the norms are catching up. But it takes more time, and uh, and I think that's um, that's an issue for Korea. Is sort of who is sort of a victim of its own success because it's it's um, it's it's um, grown so rapidly, it's developed so rapidly that uh, even though norms and attitudes are also changing, it 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 takes more time. I mean, it happens, but it takes more time. Um, Hinchong, do you see any questions you would like to? Yes. Uh, first, the last question. Can you share the prospect and risks? Yes. These are. Um, uh, so, this could you could you repeat perhaps the question? I didn't uh, get it. Yeah, so, so last question. Someone... Thank you for sharing the survey results. If you may, can you share the prospect and risks? Yes. I, about I yes. This these are. Um, oh, okay. 
discuss in detail in the survey. And if I may, I'll just uh, mention one, one important risk. Um, so yeah, there are several downside risks that cloud the outlook. And uh, uh, one important uh, risk is of course the geopolitical risk coming from the uh, war in Ukraine. And also uh, now the household debt has and housing prices have ele elevated uh, significantly during the pandemic. And this of course posed downside risk to the domestic demand because once the interest rate increases, then that service burden uh, for the households who have who borrowed from the, from the bank or non-bank uh, uh, is, is, the, is the, uh, very, very high. Because most of the, um, um, the borrowed household borrowings are are linked to loan team rates rather than the fixed rates. So this is a, a, a quite significant downside risk to the domestic demand, and uh, and some other uh, possible risks include the of, of course the China's uh, lockdown uh, and also um, 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 housing market corrections and so on. So. More detailed discussions can be found in the survey, and uh, yeah, yeah. I think we are almost out of time, but perhaps we can we can do one more. Uh, I there was this um, this question from uh, Jerome Danson, perhaps I don't know how how to pronounce the name, but anyway, Jerome. Um, thank you. Well, around 40% of the 15 to 29 year olds are employed in Korea. What percent um, for those not at school, university, and what do they do for a living? Actually, we, we do have these numbers in the survey. I don't, I, I, um, I don't remember in, in my head right now, but what do they do for a living? I think that's a really good question because why are they not in um, employment, education, and training? And um, this is often if you if they don't succeed on the first try to to win this golden ticket they will try again so they will for example uh, resit the university entrance exam um, so they will they can for example spend a year doing that or after university they can um, they can prepare for for uh, for uh, the um, the uh, the entrance uh, tests of of different companies or the civil service exam, or they can seek other qualifications, credentials, more education. So so there are different uh, different things that they do, but but it's not that it's not that when you are neat, not in an education, employment, and training, that that Koreans do nothing. It's they they spend this time. Uh, to sort of try to increase their chances of actually getting into this to this um, this golden track that's uh, which which is partially why employment rates are low and and uh, and and why we we think that the system should be uh, reconsidered but uh, but uh, with productivity gaps as as the root cause which is of course very hard to to do something about and it's a long term uh, long-term um, um, a long-term challenge good <laughs> thank you john thank you Shanjan. so um, i'm sorry to all others let's say who um which which questions were not or could not be answered by by the oecd experts um i was just wondering john and john john i is there any chance that you're coming over to korea very soon um, I'm, I'm I'm actually going back on vacation, so <laughs> we could have a coffee. But <laughs> um, okay, but I don't want to interrupt your vacation. But because yeah. this is the reason why I want to ask, because we actually is very really, we have received many questions in the chat, and uh, I think there's really a high demand uh, maybe for um, a follow up, but maybe also face to face. Uh, a round table, a Q and A session, whatsoever. And yeah, that's why I was asking. Yeah, so please drop me a line when uh, when you know when you're here on business. Yeah. So vacation. I don't want to interrupt your vacation, as I said. 
Yeah, but I think we, but also our members would be very happy to receive you here and to learn more, even if not, let's say, a detailed presentation, but just an open talk about Korea. The, the outlook for Korea, uh, for the outlook to Korea 2030, 2050, 2070, yeah? so even midterm, long-term outlook, uh, um, et cetera. So I think the survey, uh, the, the country report you have written is so extensive, provides so many answers. Yeah, and as I said, we would be very happy to have you here in person next time yeah, and uh, to arrange, let's say, a, a chat with our members. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah, um, also, Choma yeah, Kamsamnida for today, for your contribution, also to the participants today, yeah, for your interesting questions. And um, so the weekend is approaching here in Korea faster than in Europe. We only have a few hours left, so I wish you a pleasant weekend ahead and uh, hope to see you in good health very soon, somewhere. And again, thank you very much and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.